بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله ان شاء الله today we will uh, talk about practical tips uh, we will talk about the treatment and uh, more importantly the prevention of depression and it is a valid question to ask ourselves can a muslim be depressed in reality yes there are a lot of muslims who are depressed and in fact there are Uh, there is a tone of depression that, that many, many, many Muslims have. And when we talk about the prevention and treatment of depression, when we talk about what the Muslim should be like, we're not saying that the Muslim should never have any form of distress because that is not, that's not human. It is human to become distressed at uh, some point or the other. It's human to become depressed or sad at some point in your life. And it is human to have such reaction to events that take place, you know, reaction of sadness or grief. And the Prophet ﷺ himself said, وَإِنَّ لِفُرَاقِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمِ لَمَحْزُونُونَ And we are saddened by your departure, O Ibrahim, or O Ibrahim, the, the son of the Prophet ﷺ. So he, he was saddened by his departure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says to the Prophet, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ أَلَّا يَكُونُوا مُؤْمِنِينَ إِنَّ شَأْنُ نَزَّلْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ آيَةً فَظَلَّتْ أَعْنَاقُهُمْ لَهَا خَاضِعِينَ You are, perhaps you will kill yourself with grief because they are not believers, because they do not believe. That's what Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad. Perhaps you will kill yourself with grief or out of grief because they do not believe. So the Prophet ﷺ was saddened and distressed by the fact that uh, his people are not accepting uh, Islam or not uh, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about you know, the treatment, prevention and treatment of depression, we're not saying that we will take away every form of distress. But we will take away, we should take away as Muslims the distress that is hindering, impeding, that, that cripples you, that prevents you, that with, you know, withholds you from performing your functions and from being an active, productive you know, member, a healthy member in this community, in the community of Muslims in the nation of Muslims, in this ummah. Uh, that is the depression that is forbidden, because there is forbidden depression. Allah says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And do not be weak, and do not be saddened. وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا And do not be saddened. When you are the supreme, if you are true believers, when you are the superior, if you are true believers, So if we're true believers, then we are forbidden, forbidden from a weakness and sadness. How could you be forbidden? How could sadness be prohibited? It is the sadness that is debilitating. It is the sadness that is crippling. It is the sadness that will prevent you from performing your functions, your responsibilities, your, from living up to your responsibility towards yourself, towards your family, towards your community, and so on and so forth. This does not mean that we will all be uh, super happy all the time. I mean, because there is also, you know, if you're, if you're never saddened by anything, it, it reflects some form of indifference, some form of uh, apathy, indifference, etc. It is just not right because you will have to interact properly, appropriately with events and news that come, to, that come your way. So if you hear that you know, some Muslims have been uh, afflicted by an earthquake, for instance, I mean, that, that is saddening. That is not something that you will cheer about. It, but is the, it is the sadness that will not cripple you It is the sadness that will motivate you to help out, that will not cripple you, that will not cause you to, to be uh, um, suppressed or to, that will not uh, eat up your, your energy. Because sadness sometimes can, can devour your energy. 
some people, because of their sadness, they completely have no energy to do anything. They're just completely uh, handicapped. So what we will be talking about, we will, talk, we will be talking about the, the prevention and treatment of this sadness that is crippling, not, the, the, not the, the, the sadness that is motivating, because there is sadness that is motivating. And if we don't have that type of sadness, then uh, we're, we have indifference. Uh, and we are uh, consumed into ourselves. We're, 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 not, we, we, uh, we're, we're not part of this or not part of this body, uh, but we're consumed into ourselves with, with our indifference. W w the first thing that, you know, now, now the, the, the prevention and treatment of sadness, after we know which sadness we we're talking about, the first, uh, the first treatment of the sadness is at-tawheed, at-tawheed. To be a true monotheistic, to be a true monotheistic worshiper of one true, eternal, unique God, which is Allah. That is the first remedy of distress and sadness. How could it be? How could it be? And what's the proof that, uh, you, you know, that polytheism would cause you distress? It causes you great distress, enormous distress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ضرب الله مثلا رجلا فيه شركاء متشاكسون ورجلا سلما لرجل هل يستويان مثلا الحمد لله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون Allah put forth a parable a man a man who has multiple partners multiple masters that are at variance between themselves and another man who only has one master وَرَجُلًا سَلَمًا لِرَجُلٍ Completely devoted to this one master. هَلْ يَسْتَوِيَانِ مَثَلًا Are those two parables equal in comparison? الحمد لله All praise be to Allah بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Yet most of them have no knowledge. Uh, or however, most of them have no knowledge. This man that is, that is serving multiple deities is torn between the multiple deities. رَجُلًا فِيهِ شُرَكَاءُ مُتَشَاكِسُونَ Multiple partners at variance between themselves and he's serving all of them. And to, to try to serve all of them and to try to please all of them, that will cause you enormous distress. But as a worshiper of one true God, your, 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 all of your effort, all of your energy, all of your aspiration is to please that one true God, which is very easy to please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is easy to please because he guarantees he guarantees that if you seek him he will come to you if you draw closer to him by one hand length he will draw closer to you by one arm length and, and so on and so forth and if you come to him walking he will come to you running so he is, it is guaranteed you know, if you try to please him, he, uh, you will be able to please him. If you do, uh, if if you do your part uh, in in pleasing Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So all of us have one deity. How come, how come we're depressed? The deity, the, the deities do not have to be stones or trees or you're worshiping fire or worshiping, you know, uh, a prophet or an angel. You could be worshiping yourself. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, have you not seen him who has taken for a God his own desires? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, and the Prophet sallallahu also indicated that some people could be worshippers of money, some people could be worshippers of uh, good clothing, like fine clothing, etc. The Prophet sallallahu says, Ta'is abdu dinar may he be distressed, the slave of a dinar, the gold currency. May he be distressed, the slave of a dirham, Ta'is Abd al-Dinar, a dirham, the silver currency. May he be distressed, the slave of al-Qatifa al qamisa two different types of clothing, Ta'is Abd al-Qatifa, Ta'is Abd al-Qamisa. Ta'is Abd al-Qamisa, Ta'is Abd al-Qamisa, Ta'is Abd al-Qamisa, 
uh, may he be distressed and uh, may he uh, and the Prophet also said here that that's dua from the Prophet against him that if he got pricked by a thorn may it not be removed from him even if he got pricked by a thorn may it not be removed from him because that person who took for a god for a deity you know the fine clothing for instance or uh, it could be anything by the way it could be multiple things it it could be anything that will distract you from your objective distract you from this uh, from the unity of purpose from the oneness of purpose your only purpose should be the pleasure of God so anything that is that is going to be distracting you uh, from that from that purpose, whether it's going to be distracting you by having uh, too much thought about it, like you're thinking about it all day, all night, um, or you're seeking it at the expense of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or using it in ways that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, love, you, you like cars, for instance, and no matter what, you're going to buy this car because you like cars then cars could be your deity and or your god you like fine clothing and you do everything to get what you want you like you know uh, big homes you like money you like to save uh, you you like you like your spouse uh, you're like your spouse to the point of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please her or him you like a particular person, any person. So, so any any of these uh, could could become a form of a deity, and could distract you from pleasing Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In this case, your heart will be torn between many things, and in this case, you'll be caused tremendous distress. So, just make it one. Make your purpose, your goal, your objective in this life one. And if you make it one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of all of your worries, all of your concerns, and all of your needs. The second thing that is important in the, in the relief of the stress or the treatment and pre, or prevention and treatment of, uh, of the stress and, and sadness is the belief in, in predestination or the belief in al-qadr, al-qadr, al-qadr wa al-qadr, the divine decree, the divine will. Uh, now this belief how could it help us prevent distress or sadness and treat it first of all you will have to understand that Allah khaliqu kulli shay'in wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-zumar Allah khaliqu kulli shay'in wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil Allah is the creator of all things and he is the guardian and disposer of all affairs. And he is the guardian and disposer of all affairs. What does that mean to us? To know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of all things? That means that you will know that Allah is the maintainer, the controller of this universe. Nothing happens in this universe. Not only objects, but events. Allah creates them, brings them to existence. Not only that he creates the objects, but he also creates the events. So no event takes place in this universe that is not under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does this help? It helps by having your heart together again. There will be no dualism, you know, and no trialism. There is only one person in control. So in this case, your heart will not be torn between two deities. If you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only decrees the good things and someone else decrees the bad things, that will tear your heart apart between the two different deities, the God of good and the God of evil. Because if someone if someone creates the bad things or does the bad things under you know Allah's control, then it is Allah who create, who's, who's creating them. It's Allah who's bringing them to existence. If that deity or if, if that you know, uh, cause, cause is under his control. And in this case, it will not be a creator. It will be just a cause, not a creator. But if this cause is in control, 
if you believe that Iblis, for instance, is in fact in control, then Iblis then is a god for you. It is not a, a creature that is under Allah's control. It is not a creature that Allah can destroy at any moment. It is not a creature that has no power save the power given to him by Allah. It is a god for you if you believe that he is in control, that he causes or brings about the disasters that take place here or there. Then you'll, your belief is, is therefore corrupted. But we believe that everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which is... Uh, that which is uh, evil in our uh, perception may have a higher wisdom that we cannot completely uh, comprehend, but it is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that would help again keeping your heart together. The second part uh, about al qadr al Qadr that will also be relieving to our distress is to know that, as the Prophet said, وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّ مَا أَصَابَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُخْطَأَكَ وَمَا أَخْطَأَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُصِيبَكَ And know that whatever had uh, hit you would have never missed you and whatever had missed you would have never hit you. It is done. It's a done deal. It is all decreed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran مَا أَصَابَ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٍ No affliction befalls on the earth or in yourselves except that it is inscribed in a book before we bring it to existence. Verily, this is easy for Allah. لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَقُورٍ that you may not, I told you this, that you may not have excessive grief over that which you missed or excessively rejoice in that which you have gained or that which we have given you or Allah gave you. Wallahu la yuhibbu kalla muhtalim faqoor and Allah does not like every prideful uh, boaster the boaster and the, the proud. So, uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this ayah is that everything that happens, Allah brought it to existence. And it was inscribed in a book before it was brought to existence. It was inscribed in the book 50,000 years before Allah created the heavens and the earth, as uh, the Prophet sallallahu said in the authentic hadith that was reported by Muslim. So 50,000 years before Allah created the heavens and the earth, everything was inscribed in Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet. How does this help us to know that it was all inscribed? How does it help us to know that whatever had hit us would have never missed us, and whatever had missed us would have never hit us? It, it helps you with all the, you know, the, the, the afflictions that had already bef- befallen you. The, if, if you were uh, afflicted by uh, major loss, loss of wealth, loss of a uh, child, loss of this or that, you know that you would have never been able to avoid it. It was inevitable. It was, it, no matter what you've done, it was, it was not possible to avoid it. Because regret, regret is a major source of distress for people. To say, had I done this, that is why the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَوْ كَانَ كَذَا لَكَانَ كَذَا وَكَذَا وَلَكِنْ قُلْ قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلُ وَقَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلُ So, and do not say, had, had, had I done this, it would have been like this. But say, this, with Allah, this is what Allah had decreed, and He brought to existence, or He executed His decree. قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلُ This is what Allah had decreed and He executed His decree. And that's it. He decreed it, He executed the decree. Does this make us indifferent as, as Muslims? No, because this is about events that already took place. But what about events that have not taken place? You do your best, you excel. You do your best, you take precautions, you make provisions. Like the Prophet ﷺ did when he made the hijrah. He planned, he made provisions, like the Sahaba always did. They were never uh, indifferent. They were never, you know, uh, people who do things uh, 
uh, haphazardly. No, they, they were people who planned very well. They were people who ex executed their plans very accurately, and that is why they were successful. But when something happens, you learn the lessons from it if, you, if there were shortcomings. If there were, short, if there were shortcomings on your part, you learn your lessons from that event that happened in the past. Yet, you know that it was not inevitable. It was inevitable. It, is what not, it was not avoidable, no matter what you have done, because it was the, already decreed. So that relieves you so that you can always be positive in your thinking and you can be always moving forward. Forward. What happens has happened. So what should we do now? Is, is the attitude that you should have based on the aqidah of the qada wal qadr. The other thing that you need to know about the qada wal qadr is that you have one of two choices. You have the choice of patience or the choice of being distressed and grieved. And no matter what, what option you or what route you will take, the decree will come to be executed. The decree will come to take place. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, said, إِنَّكَ إِنْ صَبَرْتْ جَرَتْ عَلَيْكَ الْأَقْدَارُ وَأَنْتَ مَأْجُورُ وَإِنْ جَزِعْتْ جَرَتْ عَلَيْكَ الْأَقْدَارُ وَأَنْتَ مَوْزُورُ If you show patience, the decrees will come to take place and you shall be rewarded or you will be rewarded. And if you show distress and impatience, the decrees will take place and you will be punished. So choose for yourself. Choose whichever route for yourself. Because the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not stoppable. He can't stop the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So choose for yourself to accept them or to, uh, to, to uh, reject or to have patience or impatience. Choose for yourself. The people who accept are people who can cope well and can move forward. The people who reject and the people who have denial and, you know, and they go through the, the, the many uh, stages uh, because they, they have lack of acceptance, lack of submission. Uh, the, you, they can go through a stage of denial and then a stage of shock and then the coping starts afterwards and it could be very slow. They may not be able to cope at all. You know, some people have what's called post-traumatic stress disorder because they can't take it. I mean, something happened in the past, they just can't cope. And that is not what a Muslim should do. You know that this is going to happen, this happened, this, is, this was unavoidable. Therefore, it is one of two routes. Be patient and get rewarded, or be distressed and impatient, and then you will get punished for your rejection of Allah's decree and your impatience, which will cause you to, to do wrong. The next point that is important also is to know that, uh, that you are not being afflicted because you are bad, necessarily. You're not necessarily being afflicted because you're bad. Because this is very important for many people because many people, what compounds their grief is that they feel that they are cursed. That is why things are not working out for them. And many, people, many times you hear this from people. You hear from people that, you know, it is not working out for me, so I'm afraid that I am uh, cursed or I'm afraid that I am too far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Allah does not mean good or well for me. This is untrue. This is untrue. This could be true, but this is not necessarily true. You know, don't always think this way, because the affliction can be to raise your rank, ranks and to raise your decree, uh, degree and to elevate you and to reward you and to erase your sins. So the aff affliction itself can be an, an enormous source of blessing for the person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not only afflict the bad doers. Allah tries the bad doers and the good doers. But many times the bad doers are tried for their own destruction. And the good doers are tried for their own elevation and to, to purify them uh, from their sins. You know, all of us remember the hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas when he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa مَنْ أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً قَالَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلْ فَالْأَمْثَلْ 
يبتلى المرء على قدر دينه فإن وجد في دينه صلب زيد له في البلاء وإن وجد في دينه رقة ابتلي على حسب دينه أو خفف عنه أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم سعد بن أبي وقاس أسكت الرحمة صلى الله عليه وسلم who are the people who will be most afflicted or most tried the prophet said the prophets and those who are closest and those who are closest to the, the, you know, the ranking of the prophets everyone will be tested and tried according to his deen the strength of his deen so if, his, he, if he was found to be strong in his deen the trial will be increased for him and if he was found to have some weakness in his deen the trial will be uh, decreased or limited uh, or lightened for him so if you look if you look at the seerah of al-anbiya if you look at the nuh for instance and how much he suffered and if you look at the, our prophet sallallahu and how much he suffered and if you look at all of the anbiya and their suffering you'll be able to recognize this fact that affliction is not only for bad people affliction could be for the bad or the good because had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted only the bad or the good all the people would have been one type if afflictions only came to the bad all the people would have been good and if afflictions only came to the good or only the good were afflicted all the people would have been bad Allah says this in the Quran وَلَوْ لَأَنْ يَكُنَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَ لَجَعَلْنَا لِمَا يَكْفُرُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ بِيُوتِهِمْ سُقُفًا مِنْ فِضَّةً وَمَعَارِجَ عَلَيْهَا يَظْهَرُوا and had, had it not been that people would have been one nation, one type, good or bad doers, we would have given to uh, those who yakfur uh, rahman those who reject ar-Rahman, the most merciful, or do not believe in the most merciful, we would have given them houses that have uh, stairways of silver. Uh, and uh, we would have given them abundance, abundance, because we do not care about this life. Allah tells us in this ayah that he doesn't care about this life. And he, can give, he would give the disbelievers houses whose stairways are made of silver in this life, but he did not so that the people do not become one nation or one type. Because he, had he done this, all the people would have been disbelievers. By the, the opposite is true. If Allah only afflicts the good doers, all the people will be bad doers. And if he only afflicts the evil doers, all the people will be good doers, and then there will be no test in this life. No test in this life, or no trial. So Allah afflicts all, all. Yet, for the affliction for the good doers will be for their elevation and purification, and for the bad doers will be for their destruction. So how do you measure, or how do you judge whether your affliction was for you or against you? It is by your course, your path after the affliction. Which course you have, have you taken? Which path have you taken? Have you, have the, uh, has the affliction brought you back to Allah? Has the affliction made you closer to Allah or farther away? If it made you closer to Allah, then it was for your purification and elevation. And if it brought you, got you farther away from Him, then it was for your destruction. That is how you can judge the affliction. But, but, the, but know that it is not necessarily because you're bad. It is not necessarily because uh, you're cursed that you are being afflicted or things are not working out for you. They may not be working out for you because Allah is telling you that this is not the right path. Maybe you want to choose this path. This is not the right way. And, and maybe you want to choose a different way. The next thing that is quite helpful also is certainty in the great rewards stored for the patient ones. Certainty in the great reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stores for those who are patient. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, And we shall try you and test you with something of fear, hunger, and loss of wealth, lives, and fruits. 
and give glad tidings for the ones who are patient. Those who say, when afflicted, we belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. Ula'ika alayhim saladun For those blessings will descend upon them and mercy and, for, and those are the guided ones and those are the guided ones so the reward is blessings and mercy and guidance what else do you want? Uh, Ibn Mutarrif ibn Abdullah would say that if everything happened to me every affliction happened to me in this life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gave me th- this reward that would have been sufficient because blessings mercy and guidance what else do you need? But you need to say, and you, this need, needs to be your first response to the affliction, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ We belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ needs to be studied, by the way. The, the, this is a very big supplication. This is, the, the, you know, the chemistry of the dua that comes in the Qur'an or the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, uh, has to be studied. It is not, it's not simple. The du'a of the Prophet ﷺ and the du'a that comes in the, in the Qur'an is miraculous. إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ We belong to Allah. So whatever that He does to us, we are His. We are His. Whatever that He does to us, He is the one who gave you everything in the first place. You were nothing. Your mother conceived you, but she did not oversee your, your creation inside the womb. She did not oversee the creation of your side, the creation of your tongue and the creation of every part of your body. Yes, she conceived you, but who did all of this? It was Allah. So we are His. So when He takes something back that He had given you, you are His. Know that you are His. If He takes something back from you, it is His. Because all of you, your entirety, uh, belongs, uh, to, belong to Him. So th- th- that is the first part. And to Him we shall return. To him we shall return also it needs to be contemplated, uh, pondered over. To him we shall return means that no matter what we lose now, we are all going back to him. So we are all going to die, no matter what you lose now. Because you're leaving all of this and you are returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what you need to carry with you, to carry with you on this trip not the wealth that you lost. It is the patience that you have after this affliction. That is the most important treasure that you will need to carry back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you return to Him. You lost some wealth, so what? You are, you're going to leave it anyway. Sooner or later, you're leaving it. So now what do you need to carry on this trip? It is the patience. It is not the money that you lost or it's not the job that you lost. So the, the inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon has to be said with feelings, you know, not just the words. Inna lillah, we belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. We are His. Whatever He takes away from us, it was His. He is the one who gave it to us and to Him we shall return. We're leaving all of this and returning to Him. So make sure that when you meet Him, you have the right sustenance for yourself you know, that, that, will, that will get you through. Uh, so this is a part of the reward. And, and I'm not going to go into the reward of, uh, for the patient because there is so much to say about the reward for the patient. Uh, but uh, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that was reported by Tirmidhi from Abi Huraira, مَا زَالُ الْبَلَاءُ بِالْمُؤْمِنِ فِي وَلَدِهِ وَمَالِهِ وَنَفْسِهِ حتى يمشي على الأرض وليس عليه خطية وحتى يلقى الله وليس عليه خطية that the, the بلاء or the affliction will continue to befall the believer in his offspring, his wealth and in himself until he meets Allah with no sins with no sins so that is an important part of the reward for the, uh, the, the patient ones also, uh, Anas ibn Malik says, uh, when he interpreted the ayah, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَى الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرَ حِسَابٍ He says that the people uh, the, will be brought, you know, the people of zakat and siyam and hajj will be brought 
before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna ma wafas sabiruna ajram bagayra hasab. Most certainly the, the patient ones will be given the reward without reckoning. So Anas ibn Malik was explaining to the people how are they going to be given the reward without reckoning, without calculation, without you know, accounting or anything. They, it will be poured on them, as he said, that the people of Zakat and Siyam and Hajj will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everyone will get his reward after the scales are, you know, the, you know, the, the scales will be established and the, the scriptures will be spread out for a, everyone. Your scriptures, your deeds are spread out for you. Yeah, the scales will be established and then your deeds will be weighed. Your deeds will be weighed. And you will be subsequently re- and accordingly rewarded. He said, except for the patient ones, they will be brought forth before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no scale will be established and no scriptures will be spread out, but the reward will be poured on them. Uh, so in this case, the reward for patience is, is greater than the reward of uh, the other deeds. Why is it so? Why is it so? Because patience reflects, reflects that you know that this is coming from God, your Lord. It reflects recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it reflects recognition, respect and submission. And it also reflects, you reflect your good thoughts of Allah. You know that He's the most merciful. So you're patient because you know that there is a, high, a bigger reward for you. There is patience because you know that Allah will make you up. There is patience because you know that this is not the end or it was not for your destruction, because you will continue to be his devoted servant. So it reflects all of this, all of these uh, feelings, and all of this recognition, the recognition of, of his existence, his greatness, and that he is in control. This comes from him, you respect to him, you sub- submit to his will, and you hope in his reward, and you hope that he will make you up for it, and you will hope that he will help you cope with it. So that is, that, that is all, uh, you know, part of your, your, the process of patience. The next, uh, the next one is, uh, you know, and we repeat this over and over, it is the, the, your knowledge and your recognition of the value of this life. Your knowledge and your re- recognition, your understanding, your comprehension of the value of this life. And this ayah, please read it over and over. It, it, you can never... Read it enough. This is the ayah in Surah Al-Hadid, in the last part of Surah Al-Hadid. أَعْلَمُ أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُونَ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاقُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَامًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٌ وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ Know that the life this, the life of this world is only about play and amusement. Pump and mutual boasting amongst you. And seeking abundance or rivalry in uh, offspring and wealth. And rivalry... Uh, and rivalry in abundance of children and wealth. وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ The likeness of this life, or the parable, is like a rain. The vegetations therewith, that comes with the rain, the vegetations that come with the rain, pleases the tillers, the farmers. ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ Because it's, it's green and it is, it is growing and it is green, it is like a child. You know, every, you know, if you see a child, if you see a baby or a child, they're always pleasing to, to uh, you know, the people who have like, uh, you know, uh, 
the right sense because some people may not be pleased. But the, the, the normal people, for the normal people, a child certainly, the sight of a child is a pleasing sight. And so, uh, and the, so the vegetation that are green and growing will please the farmers. Some may ahiju fatarahu musfarra, and then it will dry up, dry out, and turn yellow. Some may akunu hutama, and then it becomes straw. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَفِرَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٌ And in the hereafter there is great torment and forgiveness from Allah and pleasure. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And the life of this world is only but a deceiving enjoyment. Is only but a deceiving enjoyment. You contemplate this parable and this is, this is enough for us. This is enough for us to understand the value of this life because it is happening in front of our eyes every day. You know, you, 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 the trees, if you look at the trees, if you look at the leaves, that is what this life is about. Look at the stages. Look at the summer, and now it is becoming green, and then it, and then it will dry out, and then it will fall off the trees. This is you. The, you are one of those leaves, and you are exactly one of those leaves. And you dry out also, as we said before several times. And I hope that you remember the percentages. How much water is there in a baby, in the body of a baby? About 75 to 80% of the body of the baby is water. How much water is there in the body of an older man? It's about 50 to 55%. You dry out. You, the wrinkles, you're drying out. So you see it in front of your eyes, in people, in the, in, in, and then... You see it also in, in the, uh, you know, when, when people die. And if that is not enough to make you really understand the value of this life, then there is nothing that will help you understand it. In this case, how does this relate to our topic here? How does the value of this life uh, relate to our topic? It relates uh, gr greatly, uh, certainly, because w what makes you distressed? What makes you distressed is that you're having some disagreement with your spouse, is that you are, you've lost your job, is that you've lost some money, is that you did not pass the exam, is uh, you lost a loved one, uh, you lost uh, some of your limbs or some of your senses, uh, the, things of that nature, things of that nature. And these things will happen, will have to happen. The, you know, the, the poet says, ثمانيةٌ لابد منها للفتى ولا بد أن تجري عليه الثمانية سرور وهم واجتماع وفرقة ويسر وعسر ثم سقم وعافية Eight things that have to happen for everyone. سرور uh, وهم uh, Happiness and grief. واجتماع وفرقة Gathering and separation. ويسر وعسر Ease and hardship. وسقم وعافية health and sickness, or the disease and health. So we will go through these things. And they make you distressed because you, value the, you overvalue this life. Have you put this life in the right place? Have you known that this is transient, this is temporary, this is so short and so worthless? Had it, had it been worth anything, Allah would have not given the disbeliever a sip of water. Had it been worth Janah Ba'uda, had it been worth the wing of a mosquito, Allah would have not given a disbeliever a sip of water from this life. But it is not worth it. So transient and so short. Abu Darda, when he exhorted the people of Sham, he said to him, Man yashtari minni tarikata adin bidirhamain. Who would buy from me or purchase, purchase from me the estate of Ad? Ad, the people of Ad, the, the people who were unlike any other nation, greater than any other nation. Uh, they're, they're, they're in, you know, they were in some place, Al-Ahqaf, in, in Yemen, between Yemen and Oman. And those, those people, where are they now? Where are they now? They're gone. Who would buy their, their estates and their, you know... Uh, Inheritance, the inheritance of Ayad with two dirhams. No one. 
they, they're gone. And, and so would uh, everyone. So th that, that understanding certainly does help us uh, put, put, this right in the, put, put this life in the right place. And once we put it in the right place, then the small parts of this life will be put in the right place subsequently. You know, all of it is put in the right place. It is really small. It is really small. So now your wealth or, you know, the, the $15,000 that you lost, you know, that is part of your wealth, which is part of this life, which is worthless. Therefore, everything will be put in the right place and you will have less grief and distress. You have to remember that, that these believers are the ones who should, should, because th this life is their paradise. And if they have no belief in the hereafter and they have no certainty, uh, of the hereafter, this is it for them. So they should be grieving over it so much. Not the believer who believes in the hereafter, who believes that this life is only about a trial, a test, an examination room. You are in, a, in the examination room. What you care about the most is your work, that will, you know, the results that will be published uh, soon thereafter. You're not caring so much about the uh, wallpaper, you know, in the examination uh, room. You're not caring so much about the carpet. You're not caring so much, even if, the, even if it is hot or too cold or too hot, you will ignore it and you will keep on writing and you will make sure that it is about the results that will be published thereafter. But if this life is it for you, you're not looking forward to the hereafter, then it will be very distressful to, to lose part or most of it. And that is why you find a lot, a lot of people, you know, a lot of seniors who are very distressed. And, and, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be stereotypical and I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, like close-minded, but I did see some of the seniors back home, you know, and, you know, I did see some of the seniors who were full of, you know, uh, full of happiness, full of contentment, full of energy. They used to come to the masjid every day in the morning after Salat al-Fajr. They would sit there and read Quran all the way until uh, sun up. You know, th those days for them were really the golden days because they were, it was like sprinting now. You know, after running for two miles, it is time now to sprint. It is time now to, to do your best, to excel, because you're getting closer to meeting your most you're getting closer to meeting your most beloved, so it is about time that, that you sprint. Like if you see, like an, you know, the end of the, the end of the race, the, the pole at the end of the race, and then you're close. You're about a few hundred meters close to this. You will not be distressed about the past, about you know, the, you know, your life. If if, you, if you're not looking forward to this, you will be distressed about everything because life is given her back to you. You, you have, you have, you're weak, your body is weak, you, you, can't, you, can't, you, know, you can't enjoy your money, you can't even enjoy the food that you eat. And there is all of the enjoyment, all of the other enjoyments, the lusts and the other enjoyments, everything gives back, give it back to you. And, and then the, the, some, some become distressed because of this. But those people that are racing to their objective and they see the pole at the end of the race, they start to sprint at the end of the race and you see them full of happiness and full of energy. If you want to be of those people, if you want your golden re uh, days to be your last days or you want your last days to be full of energy, full of happiness, uh, then you have to work for it from now. You have to increase your iman, increase your faith from now so that those days will be the best days in uh, your life. Uh, we have covered about five of the, uh, the helpful treatments for uh, the prevention of depression. And I think that we should have a break now as planned. And then we will come back and cover the rest and uh, do questions and answers thereafter, inshallah. Jazakumullah khayran. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah.